welcome back to this uh, DEPSA final conference uh, and for the second uh, session or panel. And uh, first we will have a, a session on climate policy and the environment, uh, which I will be moderating. Uh, so my name is Emma Hakala and I'm from the uh, Finnish Institute of International Affairs and I've been involved in this project uh, on the climate and environment part. Uh, so maybe just to give you some idea of what's going to happen, uh, first we will have the climate and environment part, uh, and then after that uh, there will be another part on migration, um, hosted by my colleague Evelina. And then we will have a, a kind of a uh, common or combined uh, session still bringing together these themes of climate and, and migration. Uh, but since we don't have that much time for, for any of the topics, uh, let's go directly to the uh, climate issue. And I will maybe first uh, introduce the, the speakers in, in this session. So I already introduced myself, <laughs> but then we also have uh, Lilibel Evergreen, uh, who is the student contest winner in the climate and environment uh, part. And uh, she's also a student at the Open University in UK. And Lilibel will uh, present her basically the winning essay. And then we have Valentin Dupont, who is uh, working at the General Secretariat of the European Council. Uh, and he's uh, actually at the TREE Directorate, uh, assisting in the Climate and Environment Unit in the negotiations for the FIT455 package. So this will also be really relevant. And I'm sure that we'll have some very uh, up-to-date information from Valentin uh, later on. But I will maybe first start with a really brief presentation of the, uh, the, um, the European climate policies, uh, just to give you some idea in a nutshell. I actually now realize that I won't be able to uh, share my screen, so I can't show you a presentation um, unless uh, TEPSA can give me the rights to do that, but of course that's not necessary. Uh, we don't necessarily need to have the presentation, so maybe it's even easier and quicker if I just give you a kind of a, a run through of the, the main elements, I guess, of the uh, EU's climate policy. Um, let's see. Okay, actually I will be, okay, yeah, thanks, uh, Depsa. <laughs> uh, I will be able to share my screen now. So let's do that. It's maybe easier to, to follow if, if I share it. Okay, hopefully you will be able to see it now. Let me know if not, okay. So, um, and let's go to the, yeah. Uh, so basically what the, what are sort of the main elements or the main drivers of the EU's um, uh, climate policy Oops. Um, are, of course, that uh, the main uh, objective and aim is decarbonization, so cutting CO2 emissions and, and all other greenhouse gas emissions basically as soon as, as possible. And this is done then through legislation, regulation and investment, uh, very simply put. Uh, and then also the EU has been very clear and, and sort of highlighting that the transition to this more sustainable decarbonized uh, system or economy has to be fair and equal. Uh, and then also uh, 
the EU has been highlighting these geopolitical goals and, and kind of global climate leadership as a very sort of important maybe background interest for the EU's policies. So then if we look at the more specific objectives um, which the EU has announced uh, is first of all to cut greenhouse gas emissions by 55% by 2030, so actually very soon already. Uh, and then the EU also plans uh, to reach climate neutrality, uh, meaning that the basically uh, there would be no uh, sort of gross um, emissions anymore by 2050. Uh, and then at the same time, the uh, EU climate objectives are also um, somehow intertwined with these aims of uh, creating sustainable jobs and and promoting sustainable economic growth. So that's a, an important element of, of all the what is done, basically. Uh, and at the same time, the EU uh, sort of uh, aims for the, the climate leadership part by facilitating international climate action uh, to keep global warming below one and a half degrees. And then <clears throat> more specifically how that is done or through which means that is done, uh, there is this European climate law, uh, which basically sets the net zero emissions target by 2050 as a legally binding target. So it, it kind of uh, requires the EU and the member states uh, to act on this mission in a way. Um, and then the European climate law also posits that um, that the, again, that the measures to achieve these goals need to be just and an equal between member states, uh, so that no uh, country basically would uh, suffer somehow from the from uh, implementing uh, climate policy more than any other any other country. Uh, so the idea of the climate law is in a way also to offer predictability to investors. So here we have again the, the sort of economic part that it will be easier for the investors to uh, implement uh, climate climate friendly uh, technologies for example if they know uh, what the sort of regulatory environment will be uh, and then also the european climate law emphasizes that there is a big need for climate adaptation and resilience as well so there is a kind of a recognition that climate change will go on regardless but uh, so that the mitigation will not alone be enough to uh, to save us from having to also prepare for the effects of climate change. Uh, then more specifically, uh, there is this Fit for 55 package, which I already mentioned actually, uh, which kind of gives a more sort of, it's a European Commission's proposal for a more specific regulatory sort of package, which will then drive these uh, climate goals. Uh, and I've just picked some examples of, of what the Fit for 55 package includes. Uh, so it, for example, aims for the expansion of the emissions trading system. Um, so that would also include uh, sort of sea traffic and, uh, and, and traffic in general. Um, also, uh, it aims for strengthening the renewable energy directive uh, so that it would again be sort of more uh, more efficiently supporting renewable energy uh, and its uh, uptake in a way. Uh, then we have the carbon border adjustment mechanism uh, which is maybe more familiarly known as this uh, sort of carbon uh, tax uh, or carbon border tax. Uh, so basically you know, taxes on imports uh, which cause high emissions which is then maybe a way to also bring in the sort of global partners and, and other countries in the world to follow the, the sort of stricter uh, regulations in, uh, in Europe. And then there is also a plan to enhance climate measures in land use and, and forestry. And this is a, a kind of a uh, emerging or increasingly important uh, issue, for example, for countries with a lot of forestry like Finland. So these are some of the issues and, and then maybe we can talk more about the Fit455 package also later on. 
Uh, then we also have the European Green Deal, which is this very sort of broad uh, kind of framework where the EU aims to basically make itself a modern resource efficient economy where again you would have no more net uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 and then here interestingly the EU also points out that the economic growth needs to be decoupled from natural resource use so kind of recognizing that uh, that while you still want economic growth uh, it has to uh, not um, not be so highly uh, sort of disturbing for natural resources and natural processes uh, and again highlighting the the justice issue by stating that no person or region should be left behind in this de development and then finally uh, the global uh, dimension of the use uh, climate policy so basically the idea is to facilitate international cooperation to achieve climate objectives and this would be done through or and is done through financing technical support and trade agreements also uh, but then also we have to remember that the use own actions have some global implications for example the carbon border taxes do you have to somehow take into account that they might have some uh, sort of impacts on trade relations with existing partners and then we also have to be very careful about outsourcing our emissions so that we cut emissions here in Europe while elsewhere the, the emissions will uh, rise uh, so basically I would say that the just transition needs to be global and this is maybe something that the EU needs to think about but uh, so as not to take more of your time I will end here um, and uh, I will give the floor now to uh, Lily Bell. So I will stop sharing the screen. Uh, and then, yes, Lily Bell, please go ahead and present your, your essay. <laughs> thank you for the introduction and thank you for a really good summary of uh, Europe's current uh, environmental policies. So, uh, my paper is called um, Beyond Carbon Neutrality, Three Steps for the EU, and overall it explores what we should do once the Europe reaches carbon neutrality, so it's very futures orientated, um, and it's kind of based on the three um, goals of the European Green Deal that Emma just summarised, which is um, overall to make Europe the first climate neutral continent, but this involves having no net greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, decoupling economic growth and resource use and leaving no person or place behind. And I very much believe that the EU's ability to lead the climate response is key to its role as a global leader. Um, so my paper provides a vision for this future trajectory um, through three key steps. So after Europe has achieved climate neutrality, the first logical step is to help other countries and regions to do the same. Obviously the climate crisis is a collective problem, so protectionism doesn't really help anyone. We must share innovations used in Europe's transition. And I think a special, a special focus needs to be given to um, methods which limit economic disruptions because some states are unwilling or unable to make short-term economic sacrifices. So that's a barrier to them creating change. And I think the EU, if it took a role of a facilitator, this would directly expand its global leadership and influence, um, which I think may be key to retaining influence as rising powers continue to shift the international system's balance. Um, and I think it's important that the EU aids these rising powers rather than taking a kind of competitive zero sum view. Um, and of course, I recognize this, this process of aiding others in achieving climate neutrality may be difficult, but I do believe it's necessary in the long term. So the second step after becoming the first climate neutral continent is to become the first climate positive continent. And this obviously requires furthering the methods that are used to achieve carbon neutrality. Um, and I think Europe has world leading academic knowledge and innovation networks, including science and technology companies. And I think this kind of knowledge exchange within networks may be really key to expanding um, influence in this area. And definitely like Emma mentioned, Legal measures like the European climate law are probably key to preventing uh, countries' climate policies from sliding backwards, maybe it's due to domestic agenda changes or administration changes. And one ambitious expansion that I really put forward 
would be for the EU to make a pledge to make Europe the first continent to remove all of its historic emissions. And this was inspired by Microsoft's commi commitment to remove its historical emissions by 2050. And obviously there's a difference in a company pledging this and a continent doing it. And I think the kind of biggest challenge is actually quantifying historical emissions. And then of course, step two to that challenge is then finding efficient nature-based and technological methods of carbon removal. But still, I, I wanted to really push this forward as a point because I think Europe is home to many of the early industrializers and therefore has had disproportionately large impact on the environment and causing climate damage. So I kind of I think this leads to a moral duty, arguably, to address its neg negative environmental impact and actually potentially outperform other regions and countries uh, in this area. And I think as well, this kind of ambitious action would be a very strong signal um, on kind of Europe's values and trajectory. And also it might actually help to counterbalance if other regions and countries miss necessary climate targets, either through a lack of will or a lack of resources or something similar. And then the third and final step that I suggested beyond carbon neutrality is a broader societal transformation. We must explore ideas about how economies and labor relations could be restructured to remove social and environmental exploitation. And overall, I think this involves a shift away from government driven change, which is definitely necessary to achieve climate targets, but towards a more kind of local community driven change. And this involves ensuring sustainable shifts across all demographics of society, which obviously relates to the Green Deal's goal of leaving no personal place behind. And for this overall transformation, I think one of the key things to take away is that ideas need to be generated and there's a dialogue to be built here. And potentially the EU could initiate this through something like forums connecting academics, think tanks and citizens, and also through funding short term pilot experiments of any ideas generated. And this final step, I think, is definitely more abstract than the other two, but it is covering a longer time trajectory and it also aims to embed sustainable change deeper than temporary climate goals. So as a kind of summary conclusion, I think that Europe's ambitions shouldn't end with becoming the first climate neutral continent. We have a moral duty to act. And also I believe that climate leadership is key to extending the EU's global influence. To quickly summarize my steps, step one concerns aiding other countries and regions, especially rising powers in reaching climate neutrality. And this involves pursuing cooperation, not competition. Step two concerns the EU continuing its climate leadership by becoming the first climate positive continent and pledging to remove historic emissions. And finally, step three concerns ingraining sustainability into European society in the long term. Idea generation and experimentation are key to reshaping how Europeans live and work and separating structures from social and environmental exploitation. And I think together these three goals suggest well, these, these, these three steps work towards three goals, which is responding to the climate crisis, benefiting EU citizens, and also furthering Europe's international influence. And I recognize that since these, my paper is very much focused on the future, it's not necessarily actionable in the present. And, but I think something to consider is that the debate needs to be started now about where we're going. And I think that Europe needs to be preemptive rather than reactive in its policies. And yeah, I just, I hope I've given you something to think about. And I'm very interested in continuing to talk about this future trajectory for Europe. So feel free to chat today and beyond. That's excellent. Thank you, uh, Lily Bell. That was a very sort of future, as you said, future oriented uh, point of view. And I, I think something that we all need to think about and keep our, our eyes on. Um, so then to kind of kick off this uh, brief uh, discussion between between our panel, uh, I would first uh, turn to Valentin, uh, who is working with the EU at the moment. Uh, so I would uh, be interested in hearing your point of view on, on sort of how realistic is this idea of, of the EU becoming um, uh, or going be beyond carbon neutrality, especially if you think about uh, what the level of achieving targets uh, at the moment is. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Great pleasure to be uh, with you today. First, uh, congratulations uh, to uh, Lily Bellin for uh, 
the, the, the bright ideas that you bring into the debate uh, of what's happening beyond climate neutralities, uh, which highlights also the, the importance of, of uh, temporality, uh, which is a key, a key factor to ensure a successful transition. And I very much agree uh, when about the fact that to achieve uh, this transition, we need short term uh, goals medium uh, goals term, but also long-term measures, which we are lacking of currently uh, at the moment. So I'll just maybe quickly start by, by recalling that uh, the objective of achieving a negative emission is, is already enshrined in the climate law. There's already something there in, in uh, the Article 2, Power 1. And so is also the, the possibility to, to develop technological solution as a carbon sink. Yeah? which is uh, uh, included in uh, Restore 20. But that being said, of course, uh, we are well aware about the fact that the commitment to reach climate neutrality and, and commitment to compensate uh, historical emission is, is are very much two different things, all right? Uh, especially if we consider the, 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 the important struggle that the EU has had uh, to uh, endorse uh, this objective. Uh, I'll just briefly comment maybe on the different steps that you've outlined, uh, so keep the conversation going. Um, indeed, I very much agree also about the fact that the EU cannot wait uh, to be climate neutral to help other countries to reduce their emission and to decarbonize their, their economy. This is uh, not possible uh, because uh, the energy transition in the EU, uh, as uh, Emma said at the beginning, will have an uh, impact on its neighboring countries. And, and the other way around, uh, considering the energy mix and where the energy come from uh, in, in the EU. So there's very much a high geopolitical challenge about this transition near its border. Um, I'll also maybe quickly remember that the, the EU uh, is also currently the biggest contributor in terms of climate uh, funds uh, to developing countries. I think in 2019, it was 23 billion. 23 billion has been provided by the, the EU. Uh, but although this financial support uh, will not be enough, uh, I very much agree. Uh, uh, I mean, it, it is there already. Uh, that being said, um, on, on how the EU can, uh, let's say, uh, better pressure other countries to, to act uh, into, and to bring them into climate neutrality, I think we can very much acknowledge uh, about the, the fact that uh, the, the most important strength of the EU is, is commercial power and its single market. And uh, that being said, I think that the, the carbon border adjustment, uh, which aim at putting a carbon price on, on, on goods imported in the EU uh, to in incentivize actually the, the development of uh, low carbon technology abroad is also a, a good example of that attempt. But um, it also brings up new challenges uh, in terms of uh, trades, as uh, Emma said also in the beginning, uh, because we have to, to keep in mind that this economic approach uh, would need to be aligned with uh, commercial rules on trains, especially with the world WTO and, and, and the GATT. And, and so far, the BRICS country uh, are not really fond of the, the mechanism. And they, they really see it very much as a protectionist tool. Uh, and this brings up the question of what will happen when the mechanism will enter into force? Will they comply with it? Uh, well. It's not a given because if you remember what happened in uh, 2012, when the, the US first tried to expand its uh, emission trading system to international aviation, uh, I mean, it, it was complicated. Huh? Uh, and what will happen if they do not comply also? That, that, that Bill is saying, maybe quickly moving on to the second part of the paper, which tackles uh, uh, removal of uh, industry, uh, uh, historical industrial uh, emission. Um, I'd like to briefly comment on this because it's very interesting also. Um, on the one hand, I'd say that we really need to invent, huh, in, in, invest in carbon uh, storage and removal technology, firstly because our carbon sink in the EU but uh, in the world also are decreasing, especially in the tropical forest, so is our ability to store uh, carbon. And secondly, because well, the IPCC said it recently, it's uh, very much likely that we breach uh, the 1.5 uh, degrees target. And thirdly, also, uh, we have some sectors that uh, have very low level of abatements, uh, such as the industry. So that like brings in the question of how do you reduce uh, emission in those sector uh, currently? 
And on the other hand, as you outlined in your paper, um, I mean, it would be difficult to, to quantify emission, uh, certainly, because, uh, well, it's not sure that we have the technology and the means to do it at the moment. We could also argue that uh, remove emission with new technology is not a solution because it could like keep a dependency on, on, on fossil fuels uh, if we don't operate the, the, the right transition, if it's not done uh, the right way. Uh, on top of that, it raises also the question of energy efficiency. We could also argue that that uh, those those technology represent, uh, I mean, a challenge in terms of environmental environmental risk because what happens if th there is a leak somewhere? Uh, and lastly, let's say the agree, uh, uh, the EU agree on, on endorsing this objective. How, how would you divide this between uh, between between member states? It, it would be also a very complicated issue to to, to negotiate. But that being said, it, it doesn't mean. I think that we should uh, not uh, I mean, uh, put action into practice and, and develop a technological solution on to, to, to store uh, carbon emission. And, and I think that we very much need to invest uh, in, a, in a carbon storage technology uh, to uh, improve their, their efficiency. And uh, maybe, yeah, sorry. Sorry, I think uh, I, I'm gonna have to cut you off there because we, we don't have so much time Generous. left. Uh, and it would be maybe nice to give Lilibel the chance to also answer or, or comment on, on these points. Uh, so go ahead, Lilibel. Thank you. Yes, I completely agree on a lot of the points. And I think, uh, like I said in my uh, presentation, I, I took this future orientated approach exactly because I think almost the ideas I'm introducing, the current structures and science and dialogue is not ready for. And I think they perhaps some of these ideas may become more relevant once we've once we've moved on a bit with a, with a certain number of things. But I think the the goal is definitely to push this debate and and to hear hear back from people like you about what isn't isn't being done towards those goals. But yes, it's very encouraging that um that uh, these ideas are chiming or at least or at least bringing something to to the conversation. Um, and and do I think that these will happen tomorrow, next month, next year, even in this decade? No. Um, but yes, I'm definitely looking further down the line because I think that um, adapting to the climate crisis is obviously not optional. And really the success of Europe in the future relies on how well we adapt. And that's that's the same for any other country or region around the world, but it's definitely obviously um, important for Europe. And I think the first step is definitely what I think we're currently working on, which is minimizing climate destruction and the impact it has on people. Um, but I think, perhaps where my ideas come in um, is the second step beyond that, which is a, a kind of long-term sustainable society and looking at um, what, what it would mean beyond these things. But yes, I absolutely agree. And thanks for your comments. Thank you, Lily Bell. And we, well, we have about a minute left, so maybe it's a bit, uh, a bit too little to, to continue the, the discussion here, uh, but um, hopefully in some other <laughs> context, we will have the chance for that. And I hope that you will uh, stay with us, both Valentin and Lilibel, to join the, the final panel then bringing these topics together. And also my apologies, I just read from the chat that my uh, presentation wasn't moving as I was uh, trying to present it. So you didn't uh, see it, but I hope that uh, my points came across more or, or less, <laughs> but sorry about that. You would imagine that by now I would have learned how to use Zoom, but apparently not. Okay, but I will now give the floor to Evelina to, to take over the and handle the next panel. Thank you on my part. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Uh, we were listening to you so carefully that uh, I even do not uh, see that the presentation doesn't move because it was quite interesting. So thank you. Thank you very much, Lili Bell, Valentina, Emma, for the interesting uh, entering into our common uh, panel. So I will try uh, even now in my brief introduction to start merging the climate and migration and outline some of their links and potential synergies. Um, this is reasonable, as um, a lot of different science fields uh, from economic politology and some more obvious are linking environmental changes and climate-related uh, natural disasters to migration. In fact, 
climate induced migration is one of the most hotly debated topics in the current discourse on global warmings and its consequences. So when we are talking about EU migration phenomenon, the recent one, but also the future, we have to know that among the popular drivers, such as uh, an difference in the incomes, the demographic trends, some institutional and governance features, political instability, the environmental changes and the risk of natural disaster and conflicts will become also major pull and push factors uh, for migration. Well, the EU has already its uh, leading role in reducing global warming, mitigating its uh, effects, uh, improving knowledge about consequences for a vulnerable population and working with uh, partners to build resilience. But uh, um, this is how I, I can see um, the EU key role in prevention, the future large scale climate migration that is uh, expected, expected because of um, this uh, global warming. But let me uh, say some words on, uh, on migration policy of the European Union. Uh, I'm sure you are aware when we are talking about uh, EU migration policy, we are talking about um, who and on what conditions can enter the European Union, move within it, and what is happening once the migrant is already into the EU zone with other words. EU migration policy is a set of uh, principles and measures used by a member states to regulate migration processes, stressing again both on immigration and integration into the EU zone. It has, of course, its long history. I will not enter into the details today, but should mention that uh, EU migration policy is with a crucial importance for the stability and prosperity of the Union. Um, uh, let, let me let me uh, skip some of the of the things that uh, I was thinking to say to save uh, time, but um, I will I will say that for um, probably for the past few decades, uh, the defining futures of the European migration phenomenon and respectively respectively uh, to the EU migration policy was its east west nature, the collapse of communism uh, in Eastern Europe, the outbreak of various political conflicts in that region, later the accession uh, in, of many countries to the EU, I'm speaking about uh, freedom of movement, has led to a large population movement and the need to address this movement through exactly the EU migration policy. However, 2015-2016 migration crisis made clear a trend that had been already in place for some time, that the EU was facing a new set of challenges that in the past with uh, most of migrants and asylum seekers coming from much further away. Because of this migration pressure, uh, and as a part, of course, of a more general reform of EU migration and asylum rules, in 2020, the European Commission proposed a new pact on migration and asylum. The proposal provides for a comprehensive common European framework for migration and asylum management. Well, uh, what is obvious is that EU migration policy uh, is with a crucial importance during crisis. I already mentioned what happened, uh, happened before a few years, starting with the so-called long, long summer of migration in 2015. Of course, it is related uh, with the crisis on Belarus-Poland border before a few months. It is definitely related uh, with Ukrainian crisis. The United Nations says that around 5 million refugees from Ukraine have been recorded across Europe. Behind management of those crises lies uh, a fundamental question, at least one fundamental question for entire European Union. How to have effective border control with respect for human rights and respect for values on which European Union is built. So we are living in a very dynamic time, crisis over crisis, some score says. Let me complicate the things even more by saying that according to some recent researches, 
the higher climate risk in the neighboring regions of the EU will drive significant migration flows among the South North Corridor during the next decades. How does EU frame the nexus of environmental changes and migration? Should we make some reforms on the current EU migration policy in advance before climate start to dominate over the other push and pull factors of migration? Those and many others question are rising during our panel, but before starting debating on them, allow me to invite Aaron Bosman, who is a student of Maastricht University and who have written a brilliant essay, if I may say as a uh, university uh, professor on circular migration to present the most interesting of it. So Aaron, uh, please briefly, you have the floor to present the most interesting of your essay now. Thank you so much for your, for your kind words and for your um, introduction to the topic. Um, yeah, my um, uh, policy brief was written about a very, uh, a succinct part of, of EU's migration policy, um, a legal way of migration. Um, first of all, good afternoon. Um, thank you for, for being here. Uh, also thanks to TEPSA for uh, putting on the, to the event and, and to the speakers and the panel this morning um, for also providing such a such thought provoking discussion. Um, and as everything that you also mentioned, um, it, by now it seems ages ago, but only six months have passed since Belarus flew in migrants and, and tried to push them into the uh, EU through Poland and Lithuania. Um, and it was not the first time countries neighboring the EU have attempted to use migration in order to, to challenge European unity. Earlier, Turkey and Morocco have used migration pressure uh, as a negotiation tactic. And the problem is, it works. Migration is such a, such a weak spot in the cooperation between uh, member states. Um, when the uh, European Commission launched, launched proposals to boost legal migration uh, at the end of April, it was criticized harshly uh, in the member state. And, and for example, the, the Dutch government has explicitly uh, expressed its opposition. I must say, I was quite happy to see the diligence um, with which the European Commission has transformed my policy brief into a, a legislative proposal. Um, no, but kidding aside, there, there are very good reasons to um, improve legal pathways for migration, um, or as I wrote it, to address the EU's migration problem through circular migration. It is primarily a future-proof policy option, because Eurostat projects that in this century, the EU's population will fall by 30 million people, making up for almost 7% of the population. And the decline throughout much of the EU poses an economic and societal problem for the EU. Uh, the population de decline will make European welfare, um, health and pension structures unsustainable. Circular mig migration can provide the workers necessary in hospitals, restaurants and manufacturing plants to keep up a certain living standard. However, and, and this is a very important point, human beings are not small factories here, here on earth to produce little pieces of GDP. Um, human beings don't need to add value to, to be valuable. And, and therefore there's also a very clear humanitarian aspect to the idea of circular migration. First of all, because a form of legal migration forms an alternative to the route over the Mediterranean, Europe, Europe's largest graveyard and, and quite frankly, a European disgrace. And second, because when economic, economic migrants enter the EU and their applications are rejected, only about a quarter of the migrants is returned to the country of origin, which means that 75% of the migrants whose applications are rejected will fall into some sort of irregularity, which is inhumane. Inhumane because it's le it lets people live in a situation with no way back and no way forward. So there are three steps to make this policy of circular migration work. Forge agreements with third countries, equip migrants with necessary tools and explain the policy. Firstly, negotiations with third countries. It is inherent to this um, plan of circular migration that migrants uh, would come to the EU for a certain amount of time to work and then will return to their home country where they will contribute to the home economy with the skills and know-how they have gained in the EU. So in this way, it helps the EU economy 
um, but also the economy of the home countries. And we should negotiate with the countries of origin to come up with a framework uh, of the, on the stay of the, of the migrants in the EU and, and the way uh, that mig migrants then return back to their country of origin. And secondly, to fully benefit from the migrants and their labor in the EU, it is important to train and accommodate them. Migrants should receive an identity card that is usable throughout the union. This would help them get housing, insurance, and bank accounts. And on the professional level, governments and private sector employers should work together to create jobs and set up training schemes and language courses that would take place in the country of origin already. So migrants come to the European Union well equipped. And lastly, and this is a vital part of the policy, is to explain it well to the citizens of the Union. Over the years, and especially in the last decade, newspapers have been filled with the narrative that migrants are taking our jobs. However, the economic log logic of circular migration is clear. Migrants are not putting people out of work, but fill the vacancies needed to uphold the European way of life. What's more, if circular migration brings down the number of asylum applications because economic migrants can enter through this uh, legal scheme and don't have to apply for asylum, uh, the general population may be more willing to um, receive refugees because there's a clearer distinction between economic migrants and refugees. So therefore, I've argued that circular migration is a way of addressing, addressing the EU's migration problem. It is both in the economic and the humanitarian interest of the EU. And therefore, EU member states should get behind the Commission's proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Aron, by enriching the debate, by uh, even introducing um, the narratives on migration and the way uh, migration is instrumentalized for political purposes, uh, which for sure has their impacts on the way you address uh, migration phenomenon and of course reflect uh, the EU uh, migration policy. Uh, but uh, allow me now to give the floor to our guest, David Prapa. Pre uh, correct me if I do not pronounce your um, uh, name correctly, uh, who has uh, rich experience in the field of migration, asylum and borders to give its inputs, his inputs on our panel. Please, David, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon to, to everyone. Uh, I have been enjoying tremendously the discussion so far. And I would join you in congratulating Aaron in writing uh, this uh, very interesting and enlightening uh, uh, essay uh, with which I agree, I would say, on almost all points. Uh, so really well done. And it's always nice to have this uh, fresh perspective, in, uh, especially in discussions that have been going on for so long. Uh, and the progress can be sometimes measured uh, in uh, millimeters. Uh, first of all, just a short disclaimer, of course, that all the views that I express are just personally mine, uh, not necessarily of the institution that I uh, work in. Uh, as you also pointed out, Evelina, in, the, uh, in your introduction, uh, migratory challenges in the EU are uh, uh, something that the EU has been facing uh, for, 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 for years now, uh, and the situation has been evolving. Uh, uh, I would say uh, every time we think we, we kind of try, starting to control the situation, something new comes up uh, uh, and, and even further complicates the situation. So I'll try to be a concise, although it's a very complex topic, uh, and I'll try to maybe reduce uh, and skip all the, all the things that I wanted to say. Uh, regarding general, talking in general about migratory challenges, of course, we all know what happened in 2015 and 16, uh, the, the huge uh, crisis and uh, uh, flows of, of um, migrants into, into Europe uh, due to the war in Syria. Uh, where uh, a lot of people criticized the EU in the way it responded. Uh, could the EU have done better? Arguably, uh, yes. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't say that the migration, uh, migratory policies of the EU are, are a failure. I think they're the best that uh, can be done in the circumstances. Um, as you know, the EU is in the process of reforming its common European asylum system. So as I work more on the side of uh, asylum and migration, so not so much on the legal migration, but on, on the side of irregular 
uh, migration. I'm more familiar with with this uh, topic. It's an ongoing process. Uh, it's very politically sensitive, very uh, charged. So the progress has not been uh, that that quick, although there have been some developments, positive developments lately, as such as the new regulation on the Agency for Asylum, which uh, provides uh, help on the, on the ground to, to member states. And it was an important step forward. Uh, and then as Aaron also mentioned, uh, the issue of instrumentalization of migrants is something that uh, is uh, fairly recent uh, in the, in the uh, uh, that is happening very in the recent times, uh, especially uh, the case of uh, what was happening at the borders with Belarus last year and uh, the measures that were envisaged to help uh, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland. Uh, so there was a huge discussion on this, how to frame this. And then now there is also a proposal for new regulation on instrumentalization of migrants to be better prepared uh, for such situation in the future because they, there might be, um, they are expected, of course. And uh, of course, to complicate all this, the, the war in Ukraine uh, has put enormous strain on, 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 uh, on the entire uh, EU. I think uh, this, uh, this uh, could be a showcase of, of how quickly the EU can react sometimes. And uh, the activation of the temporary protection for millions of Ukraine is definitely something that I would say a large majority of the Europeans welcome and support uh, and uh, as you also mentioned, uh, although the figure is not very uh, precise at the moment, there are around between 3.5 and 4 million Ukrainians in the EU. And this uh, number is uh, expected to rise. Uh, it's not uh, uh, rising that quickly lately, but uh, it depends, of course, on how the situation there will evolve. Um, just to go back briefly to Arne's uh, paper, he uh, focuses it very much on legal migration, and he mentioned the proposal that the Commission has presented recently on how to boost legal migration. Uh, we also had a new uh, uh, blue card directive, uh, uh, which was uh, maybe not as ambitious as it was initially envisaged. But it, it was still a, a, a step forward. And now with the new proposals about single permits, so to have a residence permit and work permit at the same time to be able to move more freely, to accumulate res residence in different member states in order to get uh, uh, to uh, fulfill the condition for a long time. A long term residence uh, is also proposed, et cetera. And this uh, platform for talent pool, uh, which uh, is, of course, something very much needed. Uh, and I think people talking about migration in general, and you often forget that uh, uh, the number of uh, legal migrants uh, is much, much bigger than people trying to enter irregularly. So I think the number is around 3 million per year, but, uh, whereas the number of those who try to enter irregularly is around 200,000 per year, uh, depending, of course, on the, on, on the year. So the EU is trying to promote this, uh, this uh, these legal avenues. Uh, I would agree with Aaron that this should be more ambitious uh, and uh, that it is important to equip migrants with skills and knowledge uh, that they could uh, use uh, when they return uh, in, uh, to their country of origin. Uh, and I think this is one of the ways uh, or one of the focuses of the where the legal uh, migration um, should center, center on, so uh, to have the circular migration where it's not the legal migration that should just benefit the EU uh, in the sense because, for example, uh, the Blue Card Directive allows highly skilled workers to come to the EU, uh, but uh, I think we should also uh, look, uh, uh, look also how to help third countries in, in uh, preventing the brain drain that they face. So it's not just about helping the EU, but also developing these economies by, by uh, on different projects uh, and uh, helping uh, uh, this, this, the person develop uh, skills and knowledge that they could afterwards uh, take back to their country of origin. There was also an interesting idea years ago uh, to have uh, something even for third country nationals uh, residing in the EU, which could go back and forth. So let's say have a main business in the EU or residence in the EU, but maybe try to develop a business in their country of uh, residence. So to, in a way, try to facilitate uh, this movement. Uh, I would also agree very much that it's important that the information campaign is, is, is crucial in this respect. 
uh, both for the EU uh, uh, citizens, but also for the third countries to show, to explain that there are legal ways to uh, to go to the EU if they want to and to to uh, to gain uh, very useful skills skills and knowledge. Uh, and of course, uh, this is something that is very uh, much, uh, this is also a very sensitive area because it's a national competence and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult uh, because some member states use it also at the, the national level for, for, for political purposes. It's not easy always to reach, reach uh, an agreement, but it's definitely something that we should work on. And just very briefly to make a link, if you're not out of time, uh, uh, just to make a link with the with, uh, climate, climate changes, uh, asylum migrants, uh, which is an extra layer of complexity. Um, first of all, the, the regular asylum rules would, would not apply here since the climate migrants, uh, even though there were many discussions of whether they could be called refugees, climate refugees, whether the definition should be expanded, etc. So legally speaking, they don't belong to this category. There's not this uh, factor of persecution, a fear of persecution. Um, and the uh, climate migration is complex in a way, uh, in so many ways, because it's not uh, not always forced. Uh, so sometimes there is this degree of volition. So it can be voluntary. Uh, how do you define this? Uh, it's mostly internal, so it's internally displaced people. Uh, so there's no this cross-border element. Um, then uh, I think uh, media is more interested in something that sells the news. So we are more aware of uh, extremist uh, climate events or something that happens like sudden onset events and less about uh, ongoing slow uh, onset uh, events uh, such as uh, uh, I don't know, changing rainfall patterns or acidification of oceans, etc. All these things that, combined with other factors, uh, political and economical, produce these uh, these uh, these movements. But then, how do you how do you quantify it? Uh, it's very 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 difficult. So uh, I don't think that uh, the, the the right way is to uh, go um, to try to expand the definition of refugees. I think. It would be close to impossible to reach an agreement on this. And the other thing is that we would risk maybe of uh, reducing the rights that the refugees uh, are currently uh, enjoying or should be should be enjoying. Because on the other hand, if you don't have, okay, if you cannot legally define this group of climate migrants, how do you le define legal obligations? So it's a kind of a vicious vicious circle. Um, but uh, we can talk about more uh, about this in the in the ensuing uh, discussion. Uh, I don't want to, uh, yeah, hog the floor too much. So once again, congrats to to Aaron. It's a very very well written paper. Thank you, David. Thank you for your inputs. You answer one of my questions, which was related exactly with the legal framework related to. Uh, I will call them the climate refugees, because as you mentioned, the uh, 1951 uh, refugee convention do not give us uh, and do not recognize uh, um, uh, climate um, stress as one of the purposes to uh, give asylum to someone. However, uh, the question is uh, really sensitive. Uh, it is always sensitive. Nevertheless, we are talking about climate refugees or um, let's say conflict refugees. It is uh, really complicated to distinguish uh, the refugee from the economic migrant. There are some, let's say, uh, difficulties in this, not every time, but uh, in most of the cases. So we are now entering in probably into the most interesting part of our uh, afternoon panel, panel two, which is uh, the free debate. So the floor is open for questions and comments for all panelists, but also for our guests uh, uh, in the virtual space. So just uh, raise your hand, give us a sign, and we will give you the floor to ask and comment based on what you have heard uh, from me and my colleagues uh, in this session. You are very much welcome. If some of the panelists do want to start, uh, of course, you have the floor also. Well, I could actually, uh, as we were waiting for maybe the audience questions, um, I was really interested in this, this sort of idea of circular migration 
especially in in the context of, of climate migration because uh, I'm not an expert on, on climate migration by by any means but uh, the, the, the what I've understood is that often climate related migration and in general like uh, migration that is somehow related to environmental causes uh, it, it tends to be uh, quite uh, sort of uh, at least so far it has been quite uh, sometimes even regular movement like from one region to another and maybe two regions that are quite close to the to the region where the like region of origin where the person is moving from so in that sense uh, the idea of um, circular migration where like the EU could in a way offer a, a place for for people who have to uh, you know move away from their home areas during like a, a season of, of drought or something and you know there isn't uh, enough agricultural uh, output and so on uh, then that could be like one way of uh, helping people to adapt uh, to the effects of, of climate change. Of course, it's still not maybe ideal because the ideal situation would be that, that people wouldn't have to move at all, that, that climate change wouldn't be having those impacts. But, uh, but perhaps exactly to address the fact that there has been so much, or it sounds so contested to, for example, create this new sort of category of uh, climate refugees in international law, then maybe that could be like one way to, to address the uh, the situation, but I don't know how how that sounds to you. Does it make any sense? <laughs> Let me see. Is this a question to Aron or to the the whole group? Let's say it's it's basically to all everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So let me let me make a comment related with the essay of um, Aron. I, as I said, I do really like it, and I find it uh, very uh, useful in many uh, in many directions. When we are talking about uh, circular migration related with uh, uh, climate uh, climate migration, uh, I think that uh, some of your recommendations, uh, which you listed in your essay for circular migration, such as partnership with the country of origin or the information campaign or equipment of uh, migrants, uh, could apply uh, quite well when we are uh, when we are uh, talking about uh, climate uh, migration because uh, it is uh, obvious that uh, you cannot overcome uh, these uh, challenges uh, acting alone. So the uh, agreements and the partnership and the help with uh, some regions that are much more vulnerable than the others, uh, I think is a crucial to, to tackle and to overcome some of the uh, negative effects of the environmental changes and global warming. I think we do have a something into the chat, but I was talking and do not. Yeah, there's actually a question for Lilibel. Uh, Hugh uh, is interested in hearing her views on how the EU's efforts to combat climate change could uh, be improved before climate neutrality is achieved. Yeah. Very good question, Hugh, thank you. Um, I, think, I think broadly, so my paper was very much a future framework but you could take the same elements and apply them before carbon neutrality is achieved. So if we think about the EU as a climate leader, that very much is already happening in the present. I think Val Valentin touched on this as well. So for example, if we look at um, things like investment as a form of influence, we look at the global gateway and we say, well, potentially there's a room for the EU to be a influencers through investment in developing countries and for example like development aid with strings attached has typically had very negative connotations of enforcing liberal systems on developing economies but perhaps there's room for a more kind of values driven environmental driven uh strings attached approach and um that's potentially something if i was to briefly compare that to for example china's belt and road initiative which is another large scale development program that attempts to increase influence globally, that that's potentially a, a, a way the EU could increase influence and show an alternative um, to that 
because I think uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative lacks transparency. And that's something that is very much at the core of a lot of the EU's processes. Um, and I think, again, to touch on, to draw that comparison of being able to apply the framework before and after climate neutrality, you know, for my step three, I talked about kind of community level change. And I think the EU is already doing this, but could definitely expand on this idea that any initiative needs to be tailored to the local community. It needs to involve local community so that it's not that we're enforcing a policy on, on a community or a project or an initiative, um, because that's, that's unlikely to have a very positive outcome. I think in, people need to have a sense of age, agency and ownership over the process of uh, climate neutrality happening. Um, there's very much a talk about it being inaccessible, that people can't make lifestyle changes, which depending on what we're talking about, is and isn't true. Um, and I think finally the point I'd make is that um, before climate neutrality is achieved, I think we really need to recognize the fact that any climate transition involves a transition of the rest of society. And it's very hard to do with groups where there inequalities, there's inequalities and their basic needs aren't being met because those, those problems aren't gonna go away with becoming a climate neutral or a climate positive society as my paper suggests. These, all of these things are connected. Um, and I think, I think it was the, uh, maybe it's the Pentagon, I think, who, who described climate change as a threat multiplier. And I think, like your question kind of prompts, maybe we need to be thinking about that now um, and not just in the future, like my paper was focusing on. Yeah. I actually think if I can add to that, I think that the the idea of, of looking, uh, well, of course, uh, looking at the future impacts of climate change now is, is really important. And this is maybe like one of the uh, sort of fields where it seems very logical that we, we should be quite, um, quite strongly already be focusing on how uh, climate change will impact migration. And, and what then does the EU have to have to do and, and somehow to maybe integrate the, the policies uh, having to do with uh, with climate and migration better and, and thinking of, of ways ways about how to address this issue because inevitably I would say that um, migration will probably be increasing uh, because of climate change in the future. So maybe there is a kind of a tendency uh, I, it's probably not only in the EU, but in general, in, in our like people's thinking to only be addressing the, the very problem at hand that we're dealing with right at the moment and not really being able to look too far into the future. It looks like we don't have any questions from the audience, but please uh, feel free to write them in the chat. I think it would be interesting to hear also what what people have uh, kind of taken out of, of this, this conversation and, and what kinds of uh, outlying questions there still are. Um, but I guess I, I would still be interested in, in sort of uh, maybe understanding, because I, I think that the global climate policies of the EU uh, are somehow uh, directed also towards this migration issue, even though maybe not explicitly, and maybe it's not really uh, thought out in the in the policies. But uh, well, actually, maybe I'll end that thought there and then give the floor to Valentin, who has his uh, hand raised. So please go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Emma, and and once again, congratulations to our Nelly Bell. I'm, I'm very impressed, but by the, the level of the discussion, to, to be honest, and I think those, uh, those new ideas are really helpful uh, for policymakers. Um, no, I would, I would like to really touch upon something I think that uh, migration and climate have in common, is that we, we really struggle uh, anywhere uh, in, at the policymaking level or in the, in, the, in the overall global population in general to present them uh, with, you know, positive outcome. It's just like it's difficult to break the ideological wall uh, as for migration, but also for climate change. And whenever we talk about those two issues, we, we can only talk about uh, you know a negative or, or 
difficult outcome. And I think it also can discourage action. And, and it, it sometimes brings the, the level of the discussion uh, into a different level that that, that political can, 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 it can be weaponized and, and politically used in, in a way that is not encouraging. Um, so just to bring out in, in, into the debate, maybe for migration, try to purely get out of this util, utilitarian vision of migration to create something new, as Aona has outlined. Uh, uh, David also raised the hand. Uh, yeah, just uh, to briefly to comment on some some things that uh, that were said. Uh, uh, yeah. First, uh, going back to this, uh, how to define the group of climate uh, climate migrants or uh, climate displaced persons? Different terms are used. Uh, uh, as I said, I think it would be very difficult to put them in one group. I don't think that uh, the, the the definition of refugee will ever be uh, expanded. There is one interesting case, uh, I think from 2019, but don't quote me, uh, the Ethiopia case. So it was a family from Kiribati who applied for asylum in New Zealand, uh, claiming that they, uh, uh, they are endangered because of the, of the sea level rise. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the application was denied by New Zealand. Uh, but then again, the, the, the interesting development was that the UN uh, Human Rights Committee reviewed the case and uh, concluded, and it, this was all over the media, uh, uh, dubbed as a landmark case, uh, yes and no in the end, because the, what the committee concluded was that uh, the person should not be forced to return to their country of origin if their uh, right to life is endangered. So uh, in a way, it admitted that this element of climate change will have to be taken in, into account into, in, in, uh, in the future. What was problematic, because uh, in, the, in the end, uh, the, the claim was unsuccessful, is that this threshold of proving this is uh, extremely high. So uh, in the end, uh, they were not granted, granted asylum. But uh, it is definitely something that will become more and more prominent. Uh, it's very difficult to talk about numbers because there vary so much. I think according to one uh, report of the World Bank, uh, they predict till uh, 2100, up to 200 million people displaced due to climate change. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible number. So I think the way forward, and I think the EU, uh, and the discussions are ongoing in the, in the EU, in the Council as well, on this nexus between climate change and migration and how to address this. And I think uh, we should uh, yeah, uh, have always uh, try to look at the bigger picture and have this holistic approach uh, and uh, try to uh, address this also as one of the root causes of migration, because we, first of all, live on the same planet. So even though prosperous countries can adapt better to climate changes, we cannot escape uh, what is happening happening elsewhere. Uh, so I think in this uh, uh, partnerships or discussion that Anna also mentioned with third countries, we should also look uh, beyond just developing uh, legal migration opportunities because this of course can help and this circular migration uh, will is especially important because it helps develop economies in the countries of origin. So in the long run, it's something that uh, we should strive for uh, very much, but the EU should also try to look the way how to increase assistance to uh, to uh, third countries, uh, especially less developed economies, in order for them to increase this uh, resilience, this uh, to to be able to adapt to climate climate changes, because according to some some projections, uh, this could reduce the number of migrants uh, in the future. Of, of climate migrants uh, up to 90, 80, 90 percent. So, uh, and it's not just about reducing number. It's not about this, but really to to uh, help these communities uh, to adapt and to to, uh, to be uh, able to respond to what is happening in the future. Uh, and uh, lastly, there are all, all, all uh, already some um, strategies at national local level existing. So for example, Fiji has a strategy on a planned relocation because they are aware that uh, due to the sea level rise, the part of the population will have to move. So there are some plans which are already existing and this is where the EU could maybe um, assist or uh, with their technology, with their knowledge and support these plans uh, at national, but also at uh, local government level with uh, to see how to address uh, the displacements uh, in, 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 in bigger cities. So as I said, this. Uh, Holistic, uh, holistic approach is, is 
necessary because it's still very difficult scientifically to determine to which extent climate change is influenced in the movement. It's always a combination of, of, of different factors. So thank you. If I, thank you so much for, the, for that, for that comment. I think that's really, really interesting. And um, I just wanted to also to come back to the to the first part, more the more the more the legal part and and the case you mentioned, um, because in 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 Europe we we could kind of argue uh, along the same lines. I think um, uh, with the principle of non refoulement, eh? so you you can't return someone um, to a country that. Uh, in, in which it would be subject to uh, inhuman or degrading uh, uh, a degrading situation. Um, and in, in Europe, the European, European Court of Human Rights has not um, ruled on, on climate-related cases yet, um, but it has developed case law, uh, for example, based on Article 3 of the European uh, Convention of Human Rights, uh, which is the this prohibition of torture uh, and, and um, inhuman and, and degrading treatment. Um, on uh, the removal of sick persons, um, and in in these cases, uh, what you what you see is that um, the European the European Court of Human Rights has sometimes said, well, we can't uh, we can't remove these persons when they are sick because the social economic situation in the country that they are returned to um, would indeed um, rise up to the level of of uh, inhuman or degrading degrading treatments. So that's maybe something uh, for the lawyers in our audience, uh, a line of arguing uh, when you ever come before the for the European Court of Human Rights to try to see uh, to to um, include this um, environmental and, and climatal um, circumstances within this Article three um, uh, of the European Convention, because we can all see that um, Climate change and, and environmental circumstances have a way of influencing um, the social economic circumstances of, of 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 people all over the world. Um, whether it's in in the short term um, with with floods and and with extreme weather, or in the longer term because um, your country or your your region becomes inhabitable through um, high temperatures or through um, more rainfall. Um, so I think it's important that. Um, uh, we look at at, at, at legal ways, um, and and I'm, I'm a lawyer myself as well. So I, it, we, we we try to find um, legal loopholes, um, but then it's also indeed up to up to uh, up to you at the European Union to um, find ways um, in which we can um, tackle it through a policy option. Um, because legal loopholes are, are are fun and interesting, um, but we have we should have solid uh, solid policy options, um, and indeed um, trying to negotiate with third countries is a very good very good option there. Thank you, thank you, uh, Aron, David, and Valentin, because uh, three of you were talking uh, really inspiring. We have uh, some space for more comments and questions be before closing our panel. So now is a time if someone wants to add something to the panel. Just a few seconds to see for the reaction. Uh, I actually saw that. There is a question about uh, how do EU institutions engage with environmental activists and local communities? Um, so maybe... I missed it. Yeah, it seems like it only came to me, but, uh, but maybe we can talk about that actually um, still because I think we have time uh, for, for this part of the session. And I, I think it's it's actually really uh, interesting in terms of the the climate policy and and also one of the proposals uh, or a sort of ideas in Lily Bell's paper, which I thought was really interesting about uh, sort of bringing the climate policy or the sort of uh, systematic or system level change to the local level and to the communities um, and how the EU could somehow promote that and and support that. Uh, especially because often I guess that the EU is seen as this sort of very high level actor and maybe a bit bureaucratic and not so much like a community level <laughs> organizer at least. Uh, so I think that it's a it's a good question of like how how does the EU at the moment uh, engage with climate activists for example or local activists and what should it do maybe to to engage better <laughs> or is there something that that should be done. Uh, so Lily Bell you can start. <laughs> 
I think something I would definitely highlight is that the EU is, well, has for a very long time, but definitely currently is very interested in learning uh, the opinions and views of individual EU citizens. You know, we've just had the uh, close of the conference on the future of Europe, uh, which is was definitely a big chance um, to raise climate issues and climate issues were raised within that as a key concern of uh, the EU citizens. And I think something I'd I'd maybe go on to say is that although the dialogue is there, there potentially needs to be more about um, when I was talking about agency of actually having an impact. Um, I think the dialogue's present, but perhaps we need to increase the linkages between that and then actually like creating policies from that because many policy suggestions were raised and of course depending some some might not be very realistic some might be very realistic and and adopted but I think definitely with climate there's a, a great sense that activists are shouting and not necessarily being heard um, and then I think even when they are being heard say through the conference on the future of Europe they don't necessarily feel like it translates so I think this is a really, really key issue and, and, and probably an area of a lot of change, I would say, over the next few years. Yeah, good points. Um, does anyone else want to comment on that? Or overall, I, I don't know if it needs to be necessarily even only related to the to the climate change policy area, but uh, like, well, well, I guess, of course, this event, for example, is one way of, of bringing the EU policies like more to the uh, like normal people, I guess. Uh, but yeah, is there something else that that uh, that the EU should do? And, and maybe it's also a kind of a, at least I know in Finland, there is this sort of the sense that the EU is is somewhere far away and, and just coming up with policies without consulting the local level. And it's funny that this understanding still exists, uh, like even after all these these years of having been in the EU. And, and actually, I, I think that there are also many policies of the EU that are quite um, sort of hands on and, and where, you know, people have been consulted and so on. So it's funny that it, it still exists. But um, yeah, maybe maybe that will also change, and maybe climate policy is one area where where this kind of engagement is possible. Uh, Valentin, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Now maybe to quickly follow up on what's been said, and I think it's a very interesting one. Um, as you said, that there is also a space for discussion uh, through different kind of process, open consultation. Uh, bilateral discussion with institution, with the commission and so on, but everyone uh, is aware about this. Uh, but maybe, as you said, like those organizations feel like they are not being heard uh, yet. Uh, but uh, I think there is an interesting change that is taking shape somewhere with the justice and the environmental uh, law, how to interpret the environmental law. I mean, we've seen that in Germany, the court has, uh, has, has played a huge role in, in increasing uh, the green gas of uh, green gas house emission goals. Uh, in France, is also becoming the case. In Belgium, also, it's starting to spread everywhere around Europe. And, and uh, I think this is also put a lot of pressure on, 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 on politicians, on countries, on administration also to, to react. So that, that might be a, a, a way forward, although I mean, it's definitely going to take uh, time uh, to improve and 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 to uh, like uh, show some results. But but that might be uh, also a way forward. And uh, those those I don't, I don't know those this work that's been done by by the NGOs and the organization are also very always useful in terms of uh, policy making because I'm I have no doubt that they are heard on on a European level uh, to uh, shape uh, you know European policy on climate. And I know that, that there are concern here uh, uh, in the institution uh, about uh, the voice of the citizen, as you said earlier. Well. That's good to hear. <laughs> okay, but then maybe we can go to the to the part on uh, uh, concluding remarks from from everyone. Um, oh, now there is one more question. Uh, so, Yanko Mare, I don't know exactly how to pronounce your name, sorry, uh, but uh, so 
it seems like David mentioned that uh, the EU migration policy has been successful so far, uh, but uh, um, do, the, do the rest of us, does the rest of the panel agree? Uh, and if yes, to which extent do they think that that is the case or not? So do we agree with the idea? Well, let's maybe give first the floor to David in order to <laughs> defend his uh, argument. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, just, to, just to clarify, I'm not claiming that it has been successful. I'm just saying it's not always a failure as it's uh, presented. I, I personally think that uh, it could be better and should be better. And that's uh, why uh, the discussions are ongoing also to reform the common European asylum system. Uh, to make it more more just, more efficient, to increase the, the guarantees for vulnerable groups. Uh, of course, it's always difficult. One of the problems is finding this uh, balance between solidarity and responsibility within the within member states. Uh, and uh, the issue of those deserving international protection and those who don't, as you say, it's a very sensitive one, and uh, economic migrants. Uh, are not entitled to international protection, but uh, does this mean that they should not be helped? That's a that's a part of a of a bigger debate, a bigger discussion. So just to, just to conclude, uh, yes, of course, there's much more room for improvement. Uh, I hope that, uh, that the, a number of legislative files will be closed in the in the in the. I'm not going to say months to come, but in the, in the next couple of years, because that's more realistic. Uh, and of course, there's a lot, a lot, a lot more room for improvement because, yeah, we, we all have witnessed uh, images and things that uh, should not have been happening. Uh, yeah, that's all my side. Thank you, David. Aaron, you also want to put your inputs? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I really appreciate how difficult it is, the, the, the migration file as a whole. Uh, and and how, um, uh, how how difficult the national political discussions are, and and how difficult then the uh, European political discussions are. Um, but, but one point that I do want to reiterate, and and, and which I think is a, is a clear failure of um, European migration policy, is the situation um, in the Mediterranean. Um, if we see that that last year, even um, almost two thousand people died uh, and, and drowned in the Mediterranean. Um, and if we, at the same time, we see that the European Union is um, funding the Libyan Coast Guard, um, which is known to be shooting at migrants on the sea. Um, if we have uh, a European border agency, Frontex, which is actively engaged in um, pushbacks, which are illegal under international law. Um, and, and that's not on the Mediterranean itself, but member states such as Croatia, which also have been seen to uh, engage in, in pushbacks on land. Uh, I think there are clear steps um, to be made there, um, which is very much which very much comes to the to the core of, of what the European Union is and what the, what what European values are. I mean, um, Article One of the of the Charter of the of Fundamental Rights of the EU uh, is is the respect for for human dignity, um, and I think that this aspect of migration migration policy um, on the Mediterranean and also uh, on the, on the on the pushbacks on land um, is clearly a point where where that's been lacking, um, and we where we really should improve uh, to also be a credible um, value based actor. Uh, in the in the world, so I think that's a, that's that's definitely something that we that we should improve on um, in 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 the future. Apart from, of course, the um, the legislative proposals uh, going forward. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Aaron. So I will repeat something that David says during his uh, statement in the beginning that uh, what uh, EU did uh, is the best done in the concrete circumstances. So we, uh, let's say, tend to be much more critical to what is happening on the EU level, especially when we are talking about migration, because migration is a really hot topic on, on the European level. But uh, 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 let me just remind you that uh, the common EU migration policy is one of the most difficult policy on the EU level. So the communitarization of this policy is really hard because the, there are some national states that do not want to follow uh, the same rules uh, <laughs> like the others. But I will also use uh, the words uh, you know, to take the words of uh, David about the holistic approach. 
when we are thinking on how we are addressing migration, we do need to think uh, it in a holistic approach. It is not possible to have a, a separate, we did this uh, today, thanks to uh, the interesting conference, to talk about migration and climate separately, or to talk about migration and inequalities of migration or economics or whatever separately, because everything is related. Uh, it is not possible to talk only about Europe when we are talking about migration changes and global warming because we are living on the same planet. So everything is related. The, the holistic approach is must. And I will use the words of Valentin who said, uh, who talk about the narratives, the way we are talking about climate changes and migration. We tend to talk more in a negative uh, problematic way. Uh, well, the narratives are building, uh, I will use this uh, term, uh, symbolic universes. So it is really important how we talk about those phenomena because it uh, developed the notion of the citizens toward them, the notion of the politicians toward them and the way they are addressed. So we should uh, be aware of the way we talk about uh, both uh, climate changes and migration phenomenon on the EU level, because this will reflect on the way we manage them. Mm -hmm.